we started with that question. Will you answer the call? We're going to wrap up this series this morning with that same question. Will you answer the call? The question began with asking you to accept Jesus, to be willing to answer the call to go on a journey. The disciples didn't even quite understand what Jesus was calling them to when he first said, will you come follow me? Will you drop your nets and give everything to follow? This morning, we we'll to be talking about what does it mean to engage the mission, to accept the call. And what we're going to do is we're going to open up to Luke chapter 9, where we actually see three different individuals who we do not know their name. We only mention, it's only mentioned, we only know by what they said, but ultimately did not accept or receive the call of Jesus. And I think we're utterly disappointed because we don't even know their name or what ended up being of any of them. Open up to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And we're going to be in verses 58 through 62. Luke chapter 9, verses 58 through 62. And what we're going to see is that three different individuals were invited by Jesus to follow the call. And yet at the same time, did not accept it nor receive it. It says in Luke 9, 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still, another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Seems like a reasonable request. Jesus replied, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, all three of these seem like reasonable requests. In fact, if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to think of three different words that come to when we accept the call. When we accept the call to follow Jesus, we are saying wherever, whenever, whatever. Let's do this again. Wherever, whenever, whatever. Three different W's that you should know when you accept the call to follow Jesus. Say it with me. Wherever, whenever, and whatever. We're saying yes to wherever. He says, I accept the call for wherever the Lord leads me. For wherever the Lord leads me, I will go. That's what Jesus is asking. Are you, are you willing to go? And notice what it says in verse 57. It says, as they were talking, walking along the road, a man, we don't even know this individual's name, he comes up to Jesus and he says, I will follow you wherever you go. I'll follow you wherever. And Jesus says, really? Will, will you really follow me wherever I go? You see, this man was probably a Pharisee and he was working his way up and he knew that if I attach myself to a rabbi, then what, what's going to happen is I could get a promotion. If I attach myself to a popular name, I'm going to get a little more fame. If I attach myself, and Jesus was growing in popularity. So this man comes up and he says, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to attach myself to you. And Jesus goes, do you really understand what that means? Do, do you really know what you're saying? And look at how Jesus replies. 
He says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So he's saying, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever. And Jesus is like, really? No boundaries? No restrictions? You'll go with me wherever? Do you really mean that? Because, you know, I'm kind of homeless. All I have is the clothes on my own back. I don't even have a house. I don't have a bed. I don't have a pillow. And so even animals have dens. Even animals have nests. But I just go from town to town, from place to place. This is my occupation. Are you, willing, are you really willing to follow me wherever I am going? Because that's ultimately what you're committing to. Jesus helps the man understand wherever very may well involve traveling. And in this traveling, we're not staying in a Ritz-Carlton hotel. We're not staying in no fancy place. We're sitting and sleeping with a rock. We're outside in the elements. Wherever is going to take you to some very uncomfortable places. So are you really sure you want to go with me wherever I will go? The most basic definition of following Jesus will mean making some significant changes in your life if you're willing to follow him wherever he will lead you. And Jesus is saying, if you're saying you're going to follow me wherever, well, what about there? Are, are you willing to follow me even there to this place? Are you willing to follow me to this location? Are you willing to follow me even there? I read a book and um, this book really touched my heart. It's a very, very small pamphlet. It's only about four pages long. And it's titled, My Christ's Home by Robert Boyd Munger. I recommend it to any of you. And in this book, it describes a person who just gave their life to Jesus. And when they gave their life to Jesus, I just want to read to you a little excerpt of it. It says, one evening I invited Jesus into my heart. Brand new Christian invited Jesus into their heart. And it says, what an entrance he made. It was not spectacular, emotional, but it was very real. So it, it wasn't like this huge experience. I just prayed this prayer and Jesus showed up there. He came into the darkness of my heart and turned on the light. He built a fire on the earth and hearth and banished the chill. He started music where there was or had been stillness, and he filled the emptiness with his own loving, wonderful fellowship. I have never regretted opening the door to Jesus, and I never will. And if any of you have ever given your lives to Jesus, you know this feeling. You know this feeling of when you're worshiping and, and suddenly it's like you just, you just get this warm feeling all over you. You know this feeling of where you, you're praying and suddenly you get this peace that you can't describe. You know the feeling of what it means to walk with Jesus where you invite him in and he actually shows up. And in the joy of this new relationship, I said to Jesus, Lord, I want this heart of mine to be yours. I want you to settle down here and be perfectly at home. Everything I have belongs to you let me show you around. And then Jesus starts to enter into different places. So he enters into the main house, but then he goes into different rooms. And the first room was the study. And, and as it talks about, this is where you read books. This is your cognitive information. And so where Jesus ends up is in your head. And he kind of goes into the study and he begins to look around and Suddenly, this person who's writing becomes very uncomfortable because they see all the things. They realize that this room is kind of a mess. Our, our brains are kind of a mess. The things that we let into our eyes, the things that we let into our ears, the things that we let into our minds are kind of a mess. And they get kind of embarrassed. And Jesus says, don't worry about that. I'll begin to clean this up. I'll give you new ways of thinking. I'll give you a new mind. I'll, I'll fill this place with books. And, and they began to take other books out and bring other books in. They begin to remove things that are not supposed to be in that library of the mind. And they begin to fill it with some theology and some doctrine and some scriptures and some different things in order to be able to focus on Jesus. As Jesus was looking around and saw a few magazines, a few different things of business reading. 
a diff- few different things that brought shame in the mind. He says, don't worry, I'll clean this up. Then he shows up to the dining room and he begins to say, let's meet here every single morning for breakfast. Let's meet here every single morning and and have this relationship. And the person realizes as they're writing this that they first met with Jesus and loved it. They met with them and opened up their word and they had this wonderful conversation, this wonderful meal together. And they were always talking with one another. But then life happened. And they got a little busy. And they got late and they would run out the door and they would skip breakfast. And they would run out the door and come back and be tired and go to bed. And and Jesus sat at the dining table the entire time waiting and waiting and waiting. Until one day they realized, Jesus, had you been here the whole time? And he says, yes, I've been waiting for you. And they sat down and rekindled this relationship the same way Jesus waits. And Jesus began to work his way from room to room to room to room. Cleaning up the person's house, acting as a maid, cleaning up every single room until one day the owner of the house realizes there's a smell coming from upstairs. And as they look around for that smell, realizes it's a small closet at the top of the stairway. And as Jesus says, hey, let me clean up this room, and he begins to work his way up there, the owner of the house says, no, no, Jesus, you can't open that door. No, Jesus, you can't have that one. That door is behind a lock and a key, and I won't let you go in there. And the smell was reeking so poorly, and Jesus just stops, and he's asking that question, what about there? If you're really going to follow me, are you going to let me have all of it? If you're really going to invite me in to clean up your life and to clean up your mess, are you going to let me have all of it? Or are you going to keep some things behind lock and key? The author writes, I was angry. That's the only way I can put it. I had given him access to the library, the dining room, the living room, the workroom, the rec room. And now he was asking me about a little two by four closet. I said to myself, this is too much. I'm not giving him the key. You see, somewhere in our walk, we begin to say, I surrender all. But then we back up a little bit. And it turns from I surrender all to I'm only going to surrender some. You know what I'm talking about. That I was giving it all at one point to Jesus, but now you can't have that. You can't have that closet. You can't have that room. I'm taking it back. I gave you control of my life and control of my kids, but Jesus, I don't trust you right now because things did not end up the way that I wanted them to. So I'm just going to take it back, and I'm just going to give you some. You you can tell me some things, but I'm not going to let you tell me everything. You see, when Jesus says, are you willing to give me wherever? What he's really saying is, are you willing to give me that? Jesus wants his followers to say yes to him. Before they even know the request, Jesus, you can have open reign. You can have everything. I love what Larry Osborne says. He says, a consultant is someone whose wisdom is highly valued to listen to. But at the end of the day, we make the final decision. That's why we're called consultants. Here's the problem. God doesn't do consulting. He never has. He never will. He's not saying, hey, I recommend this, but now you make the final decision. What he's saying is, I want you to line up your will with my will. I want you to surrender. If I'm going to lead you, you have to be willing to follow. Are you willing to follow me even there to whatever? That's what they're called consultants. Here's the problem. God doesn't do consulting. He simply stops showing up for the meetings. He wants to know, are you willing to follow me even there? There was a woman by the name of Barbara Boyd, and this woman was 
saying, come on in. She writes about a, an illustration where she says, a friend tells her, come on in, Barbara, but boy, do you need to stay outside. Now, how can she divide herself in half? How can she say, okay, Barbara, you come in, but boy, you stay out. But that's kind of how we treat Jesus. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, heal me. Jesus, bless me. But don't you dare tell me what to do. Jesus, I give you everything for salvation, but I'm not going to let you become my Lord. Jesus, I will let you save me from drowning, but I'm not willing to follow you even there. You see, to really follow Christ, to accept the call means you will go with Jesus to wherever he is calling, wherever he is leading. Are we saying that he's our savior but not our Lord? When we make this promise, it's, it's almost like a wedding vow. Think about a wedding vow. We stand up with our, with our mate. We, we begin to say these things like, I will love you for better or for worse. Do you really know what worse is yet? You, you guys are so in love. You're still on the honeymoon phase. You don't even know what worse is yet. You haven't even had your first argument yet. Just wait seven, ten years. Throw four kids on top of it and some debt, and we'll see what worse really means. Throw some health issues and health concerns on there, and we'll see if you really understand worse. You see, he's saying, are you willing, when you enter into an agreement to follow me, are you willing to give yourself to everything before you even know what's going to come? Before you even know where it's going to lead, I will follow you wherever, for better, for worse, for richer or for poorer. It's great when you're rich, but are you willing to love each other when you're poor? In debt, fighting, and trying to get out of debt. When someone spends what you don't agree with, when someone budgets or mishandles even the finances or makes a mistake, are you willing to love when someone even loses their job and things are tight or in sickness and in health? You see, wherever Jesus speaks to him as there's some, there's some risk and there is some uncertainty. Listen, you don't know where wherever is going to end up. You don't know where it's going to eat, lead. And the truth of the matter is this person doesn't follow Jesus because of the lack of certainty and the risk. Some will not follow because of the lack of security. Saying yes to Jesus means that I might have to give something up. Saying yes to Jesus might mean I'm going to be called to go somewhere I don't want to go to. Saying yes to Jesus means that I have to say no to myself. You see, because Jesus is going to take me maybe where I don't want to go. And that's ultimately what Jesus was saying. He says, in order to follow me, you're going to have to die to yourself. In order to follow me, as Jesus was going toward Jerusalem, there's some things you're going to have to give up. To say yes to Jesus means I might have to say no to going to a club with my friends. But by saying yes to Jesus might mean that I have to say no to living with my boyfriend or girlfriend before marriage because that's what he's calling me to. Saying yes to Jesus might mean saying no to retiring and moving to the home that I have built for myself because maybe God is calling me to bless somebody else or give some away or be more generous. Saying yes to following Jesus meant saying no to raising my children or grandchildren in a certain location or sending them to a particular school or just having some privacy in my life because he's calling me to disciple others. Saying yes to Jesus might mean that I have to give up some sleep by showing up at 6 a.m. to set up church. Saying yes to Jesus might mean that I have to deprive myself of certain things. And Jesus said, wherever. But you know the beautiful grace behind this is that Jesus said, wherever to the Father. You see, we sometimes will say, God, I surrender some, but
But Jesus really is the one who surrendered all. Jesus really was the one who said, wherever you take me, Father, wherever you lead me, God, Jesus was the perfect example of what it meant to follow wherever. He was completely obedient. In fact, Philippians 2, 8 tells us, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, being willing to follow God by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus went to hell, so you did not have to. Jesus was completely obedient and went wherever the Father took him, even to hell, so you would not have to go there. Jesus went wherever because he knew that we couldn't. He understood that we couldn't. And so he shows us grace by fulfilling what God says. And he says, if you follow me, I'll go to the cross. That's not what he said. He said, I'm going to go to the cross. So I'm asking you to follow me. You see, Jesus did not go to the cross because we followed him. Jesus went to the cross, and that's how we know that we can follow him. Jesus went to the cross to give us assurance that he is loving, that he cares, and that he's supportive of us. He says, I'm going to the cross for you, so follow me. Are are you trading Jesus, who is our love and our security, because you're afraid that he's asking you to risk too much? Are you trading Jesus because you're pursuing safety and security in this life when he's giving you eternal security in the afterlife? Jesus is our security. He went to the cross on your behalf. He went to hell for you. And so are we saying, you know what, Jesus, I don't want to follow you because I'd rather have security on my terms. I'd rather have my own security. I'd rather have security that I can hold on to. And are you trading security for Jesus? I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says, give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your body and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that will have not given away will ever be really yours. Nothing in that you have not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself And you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him. With him, everything else is thrown in. So he says, when you pursue the wrong thing, you come up short every time. But if you find Christ and pursue him, everything else you receive. Are you willing to follow me wherever? Jesus is asking The second thing he comes to and he says, I accept the call whenever. I mean, look at what it says in verse 59 and 60 within your text. It says, he said to another man, follow me. Now, this time is a little different. Jesus says, hey, listen, you come follow me. Before this man comes and says, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever. And Jesus is like, yeah, right. I don't believe you. This time Jesus calls him and he says, will you follow me? But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, I believe that this individual, if he had said yes to follow Jesus, this would have been the 13th disciple. I believe we would know his name. I would believe he'd be written in this Bible. But because he said no to Jesus, we don't even know his name. We don't even know who he is. He rejected the call. And We say, well, Jesus, it seems like it makes sense. He's just saying, you know what? Let me go bury my father. If his father just passed away, this man's mourning, this man's hurting. Some commentators say his dad just passed away and that ultimately he needed to bury him. Other commentators say that Jesus hadn't, um, wasn't saying that, hey, don't bury your father. What he was saying is the guy was responding going, well, just wait until my dad passes away. And then after that, I have no earthly attachments and I can go follow you. And ultimately what he's saying in either situation is that 
I'll follow you, Jesus. I'm willing to. There's a desire there. There's an eagerness, but just not yet. I'll follow you, but I'm not going to follow you today. I'll, I'll follow you tomorrow. I, I, I'm willing to follow you, just not right now. And Jesus doesn't seem to be interested in this man's excuses which ultimately might seem reasonable to you, and there's a reason being is if you look at the text, what does he say? He says, but go proclaim the kingdom of God. You see, what Jesus is saying is the kingdom of God is so important right now that we can't have you saying, I'm going to wait. He's saying, I can't have you being a spiritual procrastinator. I can't have you sitting and saying, you know what, I'm going to do this. And ultimately, we all do this. We'll say, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to wait to tithe. When, when I finally get enough money and I become that millionaire, then I'm going to give to the church. I'm, I'm willing to give. I'm just not willing to do it now. I'm going to serve, but just at a later time. I'm going to really get into my word and become this really spiritual Christian, but not right now, tomorrow. Some will say, I can't follow because it's just not the right timing. And ultimately what Jesus is saying is there's a word that needs to be preached. That people are going to hell. That people who are lost need to be found. And I can't wait for other people to be lost as they're dying in hell because you say it's not the right time. He says there's an important message that needs to be preached. All about me. It's nothing about the timing. Jesus does not appear to be interested in the excuses because of the importance of the mission. I'll give you an example. With, when it comes to importance, sometimes we ignore something that's very, very important, the, the, the light that comes on the dashboard. And, and the light that comes on the dashboard, they, they light up and they say, hey, warning sign. And sometimes we don't know what that is. Sometimes my wife will call me and she'll be like, hey, what's that little light that's lit up here? It's been blinking. I'll be like, well, what's it look like? And she'll tell me. I'll be like, well, how long is it on? Oh, it's been a couple months. What, what, what do you mean it's been a couple months? Like the, the car needs oil. If it doesn't have oil, it's not going to run. It's going to seize up. And, and sometimes we ignore this, this blinking light. And, and what Jesus is saying is this light can't be ignored any longer. Because there's people who are going to hell. There's people who are being lost. There's people who are dying in their sin. And it's because we're saying, Jesus, just wait till tomorrow. Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore this blinking light. And Jesus knew that tomorrow sometimes never comes. You see, later sometimes means never. And, and Jesus understood that. In fact, in Hebrews 3.15, it says, Today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, if you hear my voice. Today, if the Holy Spirit is speaking. Today, if he's tapping you on the shoulder. Today, if he's pumping something inside of your heart, then he says, do not close up your ears. Do not stop and just ignore it. He says, no, today... If you hear my voice, respond. Don't harden your hearts because today is the day of salvation. Don't tell yourself tomorrow because tomorrow may never come. You see, so many people live in the land of tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow I'm going to do devotions with my kids. And you miss out on discipling your kids until finally they're 18, 19 years old and they're moving out of the house and no longer going to church and you're like, hey, what happened? What, what happened? Because tomorrow never came. Or you say, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to love my spouse. Tomorrow we're going to sit down and have dinner. Tomorrow I'm going to invest in her. I just have to get my finances right, but tomorrow I'm going to do this. And then you wonder why. You end up in divorce or you end up separated or you end up in just two roommates because tomorrow never came. Jesus is saying, don't wait for tomorrow. Don't tell yourself, tomorrow I'm going to surrender. Tomorrow I'm going to read his word. Tomorrow I'm going to get things right. Tomorrow I'm going to go to Bible study. 
I just got to wait for these kids to get a little older. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. I remember our first Easter service. Nine years ago, we passed out so many flyers. It was about midnight, and we still had a box of flyers. And I'm like, you know what? We got to go. We got to go. We can, we can go to Walmart. They're open till like 2 a.m. You know, we can just keep passing out flyers. And some of the people said, listen, pastor, you have to work. I know you're eager to invite all these people to church for salvations, but you get a good night's rest. We'll go pass out flyers. I said, okay. They went to Walmart and passed out flyers. And one particular young man came to church, and his name was Jonathan. And the reason this touched me so much is because I never forgot that because on Easter morning, he stood up and gave his life to Jesus. He comes up to me after with service and I invite him to Bible study and he starts coming to Bible study. And three weeks later, I get a phone call and I was told Jonathan was in a motorcycle accident. Jonathan died on impact. And I sat there a week later, a month after this young man gave his life to Jesus in our church, after he had been in my house three weeks in a row for Bible study, as I saw him growing and I was looking for all of these things that God was going to do in his life, and suddenly his life was over. And I'm standing there in a crowd because I was asked to do his funeral service. And there's 500 plus people there. And I'm preaching the gospel to them. And it hits me and strikes me that tomorrow didn't come for Jonathan. You see, we don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know when somebody has a heart attack or a car accident or something. We, we sit here and I go to funeral after funeral, and I'm sometimes wondering, is the person even saved? I go to a funeral last year of a young person who was in a car accident on graduation day. They went to an after party. They weren't even drinking. They were in a car of somebody else, and the car got into a wreck, and the person now no longer has life, and the parents are sitting there burying them tomorrow doesn't come and you think about all these regrets well i wish i had had this conversation i had wish i had done this i wish i had taught them this i wish i had stilled salvation and i knew for sure they were going to heaven i wish but tomorrow does not come jesus says this message is too important that we come up with excuse after excuse to wait and he says it's just too important to put off for tomorrow we got to stop with the spiritual procrastination. And then the last one. The last excuse that he gives. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go and say goodbye to my family. Again, a reasonable request. And Jesus replied, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I will accept the call for whatever the Lord wants. This man is like so many others. He wants to follow Jesus, but not with everything that he has. There's something that's that's holding him back. There's something of his past that he's like, I have to go say goodbye to my past. I have to go say goodbye to my parents. And then I will follow. There's this wonderful story in 1 Kings 19 where Elijah had called Elisha. And Elisha says, okay, I'll go follow you. And he stops in his tracks. And then something weird in particular happens. He turns around and he actually kills his oxen and sets the plow on fire. And I thought, man, that is such a peculiar story that that Elisha would 
killed the oxen. It says in 1 Kings 19.21, he took the yoke of the oxen and slaughtered them, and he burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. So he killed the oxen and sets the plow on fire. But what Elisha knew that this man didn't is that I can't have these attachments holding me back. I I can't sit there and always wonder what if. I can't continue to doubt. Some people will not follow because of the attachment of the past. And Jesus is so adamant about this because he says, some of you are holding on to things of idolatry. They're more important than me. Because you know what they are. The same way that this man says, you know what? I need to go back to my parents. I need to go back to my family. He's holding on to this so valuable. And I'm not going to say, hey, don't put your family first. No, we're to put our family first and disciple them. But what I'm saying is there's things that were holding this man back. And Jesus knows it. He knows that this is more important than me. He knows this is more important than the mission. And he says, stop worshiping this thing that you're putting more important. Some of you have put your children more important than God. And they become an idol. Family is important, but your kids should never be an idol. Some of you have put sports more important than God. Some of us aren't here. You're watching online this morning and I'm sorry for calling you out but it's because you were at the game last night watching it till late in the morning and that's why you're not in church. I was watching the game too. I was disappointed. Some of you need to pray harder. You better be praying for Monday. But we put sports before God. We put our children before God. We put our laptops before God. We put our phones before God. Some of us spend more time on social media than you spend in the word of God. And God is saying, what God is saying is that has become an idol in your life and you've replaced me with it. And because of that, you're missing something. Because of that, you're missing out on something glorious of receiving, accepting the call. Psalm 106, 19 and 20. And I'm ending in a minute, I promise. They said, they made a calf at Mount Sinai. They bowed before an image made of gold. They traded their glorious God for a statue of a grass-eating bull. But how many of us have done the same thing? We've traded God for something of less importance. We've traded him for our jobs where we pursue all this money and riches, but we're not pursuing Jesus. We've replaced him with lesser things. And what he's saying is, do you trust me? Do you trust me to surrender everything to me? Do you trust me to surrender to wherever I will lead you? To whenever I call you and to whatever I am asking of you because you keep replacing me with other things. Do you trust me and will you surrender everything and come follow me? Jesus is saying, I'm taking you on a journey. He was going to Jerusalem to die for their sins. He was going to face the cross. And he's asking, do you trust me enough to know that I've gone to hell and back and I will go to hell and back for you? Do you know how much I love you and I care for you? That if I'm trying to take this away from you, it's for a good reason and a good purpose because you're holding on to this more than you're holding on to me. And I am the source of everything. I am what you need. I will give you water to drink. I will give you food to eat. I will be everything you ever wanted. I will fill your cup when you are empty. I will give you water in the desert. I will give you exactly what you need. But do you trust me? Do you trust me to say, I will respond to you, Jesus, wherever you lead me? 
whenever you call me and to whatever you're asking me to do. This is a commissioning service where we're asking you to accept the call. When you came in here, you received a flyer. And on one side it says, I answered the call. On the other side it says that I will follow Jesus wherever, whenever, and whatever he is leading me to. At the very beginning of this series, we said, are you willing to drop your nets to follow him? I'm asking you right now, are you willing to follow Jesus in your life wherever, whenever, and to whatever he is leading you and guiding to you? Do you want to follow him so badly that you attach yourself to him and you're willing to let him lead you and guide you knowing that it's for your best interest? If you're willing to do that this morning, as we sing, instead of doing communion, what we're going to do is we're going to do a response. I'm going to ask for you to fill out your name if you're willing to follow Jesus wherever, whenever, and to whatever. And as we sing this song of response, you can come down here, and I'm going to ask Pastor Eric and Josh to join me along with Pastor Falk up here as the church leaders. And you can put your card in this bucket just with your name on it, just saying that, yes, I'm going to receive this call. And in exchange for this card, you're going to get a bracelet. This bracelet is to be worn as a reminder that may, sometimes God might call you to some things, places that you don't necessarily want to go. And it's a reminder that Jesus went where he didn't want to go for you. You might be called at certain times that seem inconvenient. Maybe you're in the lunchroom and God says, hey, go talk to that person across the room. And you're like, no, God, that's crazy. I'm not being one of them. Maybe you'll be at the grocery store and Jesus will say, hey, you'll get a tap from the Holy Spirit and say, hey, go pray over that person in line. And you're like, no, 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 no. That's for a Jesus freak. I'm not one of those. Are you willing to follow him wherever, whenever, and to whatever he leads and calls you to? This is a reminder that you are making this commitment, that you are on mission. When Jesus is leading you through the Holy Spirit and you're agreeing to this call, and if you're willing to agree to this, we're asking for you to wear this bracelet just as a reminder to what you're agreeing to today. I'm going to ask for you to stand to your feet. We're going to worship one more time. And if you're willing to respond to the call, then you can make your way down. Let me pray first. Father, I know there's some already making their way down here because they're, they're saying, yes, the Holy Spirit is tapping me. And today is the day that I'm going to respond to the call no matter what. Father, I pray that this is something that we all are willing to do. I pray this is something that your Holy Spirit speaks to all of us to say, yes, I am willing to be on mission with you, Jesus, because you went to hell for me and you know what's best for me. And now you're calling me to participate with you to see what you are going to do. Father, bless this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. We love